Hello, I'm Deepak Bhatt reporting for ACC.org at ESC Congress 2018 in Munich, and I'm here with my good friend Professor Gabriel Steg, and we're going to give you the highlights of what has been happening at ESC today. There's been once more lots of different trials presented. Some are follow-up from previously presented trials. Some are totally new. And speaking of totally new, there was a bolus of data here regarding aspirin and primary prevention. So let's start with the ASCEND trial that examined patients with diabetes that I guess I'll say are primary prevention in as much as they didn't have established atherosclerosis. So I guess that's primary prevention, uh, who were randomized to receive aspirin or to receive a placebo. And the trial overall met its primary endpoint, where there was a statistically significant reduction in ischemic events. There was an excess in bleeding, uh, mostly gastrointestinal bleeding and not so much fatal or intracranial bleeding. So overall, I thought it looked pretty good and was a good net clinical benefit. Uh, but what did you think? Well, I think this is really important because in routine clinical practice, we know that a lot of diabetic uh, patients receive aspirin because of the concern related to cardiovascular events in these patients, particularly right. myocardial infarction. And certainly to prevent myocardial infarction, it does work. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I think that's absolutely right. And you know, there was another trial presented as well, ARRIVE, that also examined aspirin in primary prevention, albeit not a, a diabetic-specific trial. Uh, there, strictly speaking, the primary endpoint in the intent to treat analysis was not met. Some of the on-treatment analyses looked favorable. Some of the secondary endpoints, such as myocardial infarction, fatal plus non-fatal myocardial infarction, were positive. So uh, a bit of a mixed message there. Well, I guess a purist would say you know, the trial was uh, negative overall, but, but there are some positive signals in there for believers. So. Uh, how would you integrate that into our knowledge about whether aspirin should be used for primary prevention? Well, what is really hard in primary prevention is we know that we always, if we use aspirin for primary prevention, we know that it's going to work to a certain extent, but we're going to have to pay a constant price of bleeding regardless of the background risk of patients. Right. So the question is how much cardiovascular risk there is to offset the price we're going to pay for bleeding. And I think positioning patients on that scale of risk and benefit is really critical. And what I don't fully understand is where is the arrived patient population on that scale of risk? Now, it's a great point. It was meant to be a very high-risk primary prevention population. The actual event rates were very low. So I think just in real contemporary practice, at least in patients eligible for clinical trials, they ended up getting a much lower risk patient population than was attended. Well, uh, along the lines of antithrombotic therapy and uh, trying to get high risk patients, what can you tell us about the Mariner trial? You were involved in that study that was presented here as a late breaker and published in New England Journal. Yeah, Mariner is trying to study tried to study the issue of long-term antithrombotic prevention for uh, venous thromboembolism in patients who were medically ill and hospitalized. We know that mm -hmm. even during ho hospital admission, patients at risk receive prophylaxis. Right. But we know that risks persist, at least in certain patients, beyond hospital discharge. So Mariner enrolled 12,000 patients who were recently discharged from the hospital for a medical condition putting them at risk for venous thromboembolism, and they were selected on the basis of the modified improved risk score as well as, as D-dimers. And those patients who were at highest risk were randomly assigned to either rivaroxaban using a standard dose of 10 milligrams once a day for patients with normal renal function, or a reduced dose of 7.5 milligrams a day for patients with a creatinine clearance between 30 and 50, mm -hmm. com compared to placebo. And the primary outcome was a composite of symptomatic venous thromboembolism or fatal ven or death related to venous thromboembolism. And somewhat to our disappointment, there was a modest, non-significant reduction in the primary outcome with rivaroxaban. It's interesting to note that overall, the rates of events were low, and I think somewhat lower than one might have anticipated, even with risk scoring. Mm. The key secondary outcome of non-fatal symptomatic venous thromboembolism was reduced with rivaroxaban. But as one would expect, there's always a price to pay when you uh, use an antithrombotic, even at a reduced dose, and major bleeding was increased by approximately 88% in patients receiving rivaroxaban compared to placebo. So overall, I think the study is not entirely negative, but certainly the primary endpoint was not met. And I think it doesn't argue for routine use of this treatment for prophylaxis, probably for selective use in patients at highest risk.
Yeah, no, I think it's really informative, and it's surprising how a lot of these trials, the event rates don't seem to be as high as we think they should be. Uh, maybe it's just a function of who ends up getting into clinical trials. Well, there was uh, another aspect of Ascend, too, that might be worth mentioning. We talked about the aspirin randomization. There was also an omega-3 fatty acid, one gram versus placebo aspect. And that part of the trial, at least uh, on first uh, glance and first presentation, looked totally negative, uh, or I should say totally neutral. It's not that there was harm, but there was no evident benefit at all uh, on ischemic events. So. You know, a lot of the uh, older data and observational data have been conflicting as far as whether uh, triglyceride reduction in omega-3s are beneficial, but this trial was pretty clearly neutral. I, I guess I would just say with the caveat, you know, that was only a gram, and uh, that's kind of low. Many people in the field think that a higher dose uh, would be necessary if there's going to be any benefit. A bunch of ongoing trials were involved with one of them, of course. And patients were not selected on the basis of having elevated triglycerides in the first place. so. Giving a low dose of a triglyceride-lowering drug to patients who don't have necessarily elevated triglycerides might not be expected to work. I think overall the data so far is rather negative when you look at randomized trial data for these, for these agents. But there are a couple of big trials that are coming up that are larger and probably slightly better designed that are going to be really interesting to look at. Yeah, I agree with you. You know, the Mendelian randomization data are interesting and suggest that triglyceride reduction or triglycerides are on the causal pathway to atherosclerosis. But whether that's ApoB mediated, uh, whether any of the current regimens that are being studied produce enough of a reduction in triglycerides to actually matter. I mean, that's what clinical trials are for, and we should find out in the next year or two. Good. Well, anything else that you think was really important? There, there was a TRIX3 uh, trial update uh, looking at the six-month uh, data. The one-month data had been previously presented just showing that a more uh, restrictive transfusion threshold was just as good as a more liberal one uh, for cardiac surgery patients, so, sort of supporting to be judicious and cautious in transfusing. Uh, what do you think about that? Oh, this is a really important question. Uh, we often uh, disregard uh, the cost and, and potential harms of transfusion. Transfusion is not a benign therapy. It has right. cost and side effects, and we should be judicious in its use. And somewhat surprisingly, almost all of the randomized trials that have compared transfusion strategies in patients with orthopedic surgery, GI bleeding, or cardiac surgery have shown no benefit in liberal transfusion strategies right. compared to restrictive transfusion strategies. Now, the only remaining blind spot is patients with acute myocardial ischemia or acute myocardial infarction, and there are a couple of trials that are ongoing. There's one big trial in North America called MINT. There's yes. one in Europe called REALITY that will shed more light in the near future on this topic. Yeah, those are important studies for sure. And in the case of TRIX3, of course, these are cabbage patients, so presumably they're revascularized and don't have a bunch of ischemia, at jeopard, uh, myocardium at jeopardy. So whether the same principle of uh, restrictive transfusion would hold true for somebody with multiple coronary artery blockages, recent MI, yeah, that is still an unanswered question. Great. Well, those are terrific trials, and it's just uh, really a sampling of all the good stuff here at ESC. I hope that gives you at home uh, some sense of the excitement here, and I'd like to thank Professor Steg for helping Thank me give you. you guys a recap.